We have an incredible youth group, incredible kids ministry, lots of, lots of real rich things going on here. And as we've continued to say, God has saved the very best for when? Right now. And uh, we're going to continue our series, The Jesus I Know. And man, I have to tell you, I, uh, man, when, anytime I think that I've achieved a level of authenticity, I get in touch with this guy and it's like, man, I've got yards to go. One of the most authentic, real, wonderful people uh, in my life. Would you guys welcome my pastor, Ronnie Meek? <laughs> no, no, I, I've, I've, I'm, I've barely got enough time as it is. Sit, sit, sit down. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, Alan sometimes gets a little carried away. Uh, Evelyn, I do know your name, and he does too. So it's Evelyn Fairweather, yeah. And uh, anyway, um, while they're putting my uh, scripture verse up, I just want to say uh, a number of you know that I used to work here, and uh, <laughs> and I am uh, I couldn't be any more thrilled or any more uh, pleased with the leadership of this church. Uh, people ask me from time to time, you know, well, how does it feel to be retired? Great. <laughs> Feels great. And I'm very happy about, uh, about what Pastor Kevin and, uh, and the rest of the staff are doing here. It's, uh, it's wonderful. And I also want to say, this is not my normal attire. Now that I'm retired, I don't have to button my vest. I will leave it open. Uh, yeah. Would you stand with me? Let's read this passage together. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, I thank you for the life that is in your word. I thank you for the life that is present in the power of the Holy Spirit here today. I pray that you would anoint each person, give us ears to hear, give us hearts to understand what you want to say. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I met Jesus uh, through my parents, Harvey and Margaret Meek. And uh, they were actually uh, a little older than that when I was born. Some of you, well, a few of you probably remember my dad some of you may remember my mom. That's what they look like. That's where I got my looks. Yeah. And they, uh, they met Jesus through, through their parents. Um, now, my dad's uh, father died when he was four, probably still three, uh, in 1920 from the Spanish flu uh, epidemic, which didn't originate in Spain. But anyway, uh, his mother, uh, uh, Martha... Uh, Martha Fagan Meek um, had six children, and, and she was a widow the rest of her life, raised, raised six kids during the Depression, and she didn't have much money. He, his dad had been a sharecropper, so he didn't leave a whole lot for her, but she had faith, and she passed that on to her son. And then my mom's parents, uh, Alan and Jewel Mitchell, uh, Alan Mitchell was a, a pioneer Pentecostal preacher in the early part of the 20th century. He, he actually came from Camden, Tennessee, and apparently he was from a pretty substantial family, a pretty um, well-respected family up there. But when he became a Pentecostal preacher, they kicked him out of the family and uh, didn't want to have anything to do with him anymore. But uh, he, they passed on a heritage. And, and my heritage, let me just say this, my heritage doesn't make me any better than uh, are more important. I cannot overemphasize, though, how blessed I am to have the heritage that I have. Because, you know, God, God knew me from the very beginning, and he knew what a rascal I am. Seriously, he knew this guy's going to need some help. If he's going to make it. And so he put me in a situation where I had this rich heritage. And I didn't always appreciate it. Uh, I, I was probably, I don't know, I, I may have even been in my 40s before I began to realize just how, what a fabulous rich heritage I had 
growing up. In fact, as a kid, I didn't, I didn't appreciate it at all. I thought, this really stinks. I am a preacher's kid in a small town in rural Tennessee, and everybody knows my name, and everybody knows what I'm doing, and everybody's into my business, and this is just, this is, this is terrible. But, uh, but God knew what he was doing. And nothing about what I'm going to share has has come to me through my own righteousness because uh, my own righteousness ain't that hot. It just really isn't. Uh, I know sometimes when somebody has been a a pastor for a long time in a situation, you kind of go, well, you know, there's something really special about them. No, uh, there isn't. But there's something really special about Jesus. And the Jesus that I know. I gave my life to Jesus when I was six years old, and that's how cute I was at the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and my, I remember uh, it was in this little church that my dad pastored in Millersville, and um, I don't know how many it, the church would seat. It probably would seat 50. I, I don't know, but that seemed like a a stadium to a six-year-old kid, and it had a uh, it had a pot-bellied stove that on winter mornings my dad would come in and about an hour or so before church and load that thing up with coal and get the, get the fire going to heat things up, uh, because he was going to preach about the fire that uh, that you, that you could flee to come, and and I remember when I went down to the altar uh, to give my life to Jesus. I remember my dad saying. Now, we haven't forced Ronnie into any of this, and they hadn't, but boy, had I heard a lot about hell, and I didn't want to go there, and so, uh, you know, I, as a six-year-old, I got, I got saved, I got baptized, and um, somehow between six and 11, I don't know what I did, but by the time I was 11, I figured I probably needed to do this all over again. And I needed to rededicate my life. And so I did, and I I got baptized again. Um, Justin holds the record uh, for a number of baptisms. But, but, yeah, I only had three. Uh, Yeah. Uh, And I got baptized in Slater's Creek in Millersville. And that wasn't me getting baptized, but that was my dad baptizing somebody. And that was the place in the creek where he would do the baptisms. And um, it's marked by a tire. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's pretty special. Uh, <clears throat> and there was a period as a, as a teenager, you know, when you're a teenager, you kind of go through some confusion. I don't know if anybody else did. I enjoyed being a teenager, but I was confused. Uh, one of the things about being in a, in a small church, a small rural church, and your dad being the pastor is everybody assumes you're going to become a pastor. And, and I have always been the kind of person that if everybody assumed left, I went right. And if everybody assumed right, I went left. And that's, I think I'm probably still that kind of person. And <clears throat> so I didn't really want to ever be a pastor. But there was a period in my teenage years when I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's what I'm supposed to do. And uh, me and a guy named Don Carter would go around and we'd preach at, uh, at various churches, little churches, the ones that let us come to preach. No one ever asked us back. <laughs> That's because we just weren't very good. We were, we, were, we were really not very good preachers. Don stayed with the calling, ended up, of all things, coming to a place called Smyrna, starting a little Assembly of God church, that, that my dad finally came and took over a few years later. And uh, anyway, it's now Springhouse. But, uh, but I kind of went in the other direction. Uh, I started having some issues with, with church. And there were a couple of issues that I, that I recall very clearly. Uh, one of them, and this, this kind of gives you an idea of what the, what the atmosphere was that I was in. One of them, they, they had a magazine that would come out monthly for, for teens. And the name of the magazine was High Call, which at the time had a very different meaning from what it has today. They might want to rethink that name if they were naming it today. But it was High Call, and uh, the one month they came out with an issue about sex. 
Yeah. I'm not going to say that again. You heard me the first time. <laughs> or you didn't. And, and they came out, they came out, and, and, I, and I thought, what is this? Wow. And I don't remember what it said. I just remember being blown away by the fact that they had even mentioned that. <laughs> And about 10 years later, I got the rest of the story. Uh, I, met a, I met a man named Gail Irwin, who became, uh, became, became a pretty good friend. It turns out that Gail Irwin had been the editor of that magazine. And he had been the one who'd, who, had, who had put out that issue. And it turns out that after the, the week that he put it, after he put it out, he got a visit from the assistant general superintendent of the Assemblies of God. Someone came down from Mount Olympus and went into his office, goes, what is this? And he explained, well, you know, I, I, we feel like that our, our people, our, our young people need some instruction in this. And so I'm planning on putting this out every year. There'll be an issue of this. And uh, Gene Raymond Carlson was a man's name. Brother Carlson said, you will not be putting this out every year. In fact, you will never put this out again because our young people don't think about such things. <laughs> and so that was kind of the atmosphere that, I, that was around me and led me to believe that I might not have been one of their young people. <laughs> the other issue that that came up was, uh, was about race. You know, I didn't know, I didn't know a black person until I was a sophomore in high school. I mean, that was just the culture that, of, of that day. And that was when school integration began to happen. And boy, I look back at it now and there were, I, I don't know, there might've been uh, maybe 12, 15 in our high school, uh, uh, black kids who had been sent to our high school, and I look back at it now and go, wow, I, I, boy, do I have some admiration for those, for those kids. But anyway, we, we uh, you know, I, I made friends uh, with, with a couple of guys that I played football with, and I remember saying to my dad, you know, well, what if I were to invite Terry to come to church with me? And my dad, you know, he's a godly man and God love him, but, you know, he, he grew up at a different era and a different time. And what he said to me is, you better not. And I thought, something is wrong here. So, so, something is very wrong here. And so I, I, that wasn't really why I left the church or left the Lord. The reason that I left was because I wanted to go do some sinning. <laughs> I mean, it was the attraction of being a prodigal. Seriously, but I could, but those things didn't help. They kind of were the cover to, to go and do that. So I went to, uh, uh, I guess my last hurrah was my freshman year at Evangel College, Springfield, Missouri, and that was an Assembly of God school. And I almost went back the next year, but I didn't. It is a good thing I didn't because the guy who was going to be my roommate, he'd been a good friend of mine, got kicked out the next year for leading some rebellion or something. He led a, a campus uprising, and I've... <laughs> for sure would have been right in the middle of that. <laughs> and, I, and I went to MTSU and, uh, and began to, to major in theater. And uh, this picture is, is kind of from my prodigal years. And, you know, I'm not just putting that up there. Because, I mean, I've got some rougher looking ones, okay. But the thing to notice, if you really look at the eyes, is they're empty. They're vacant. And let me just say, I was having fun, but I was empty. I was having fun, but I was hollow. And it just wasn't, wasn't feeling very good. At 25, I came back to the Lord. And the reason that I came back to the Lord is because the Bible is true. Uh, no one could really share with me because I, I knew more scripture than most of the people who were trying to share with me. And, and the ones that knew more scripture than me, I knew enough questions to mess, mess the whole thing up. But when the Holy Spirit starts dealing with you, when, when the hound of heaven gets loosed on you, then, then you start paying attention. And it, and it became clear the Bible is true. And so here's the, I mean, not all of the stories are literal and, and not all of the examples are good, but it's all truth. 
It, it is truth. And so I could either live my life knowing that I was rejecting the truth and living a lie, or I could surrender and come back. And believe me, I, I didn't make that decision in 10 seconds. It, I, I, but I finally did and went, I, you know, I got to do it. I got to come back. I, whew, this means going to church and all that stuff. Of course, we don't think that anymore, but we should. More on that in a minute. I came back to the Lord, and, uh, and boy, this, this, this Scripture verse just was so real and powerful. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I was 25 years old, and I was weary. I was already weary, already soul-burdened soul heavy. And, you know, I kind of grew up in a culture that sort of pictured God kind of, you know, looking at you and going, yeah, you did it again, didn't you? Hmm? Yeah. But when I came back, that wasn't what I found. I found a Jesus who was ready to accept me. I found, I found, I found a Jesus who was glad to see me. Glad that, that I was back. Jesus set me free. He was true to His Word. I gave my life to Jesus as a six-year-old. And though I left Him, and though I, I did, or tried to, He never left me. He never left me. I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up with that theology, but because I grew up with a theology that, you know, I, every week I needed to be down in the altar giving my life to Jesus. Uh, what I didn't understand was every second I needed to be giving my life to Jesus. So never mind every week. But, but the truth is, once you give your life to Him, He takes it. And so the Jesus that I know can be trusted to keep me. To keep me. Over in, uh, over in John chapter 6, He said, This is the will of the one who sent me, that I should lose none of those that He has given to me but that I should raise him up at the last day. So it's up to him, and he does. He does keep us. And I wondered, how is it going to take this time? Because through my, through my childhood years and my teen years, it was kind of like this, you know, with, with the Lord. I mean, I was, I was on fire, and, and I was whatever the opposite is, drowning. You know, I was on fire, and I was drowning. You know, how is it going to take and, and, he, and, and two things in particular he brought into my life. Uh, the first one was uh, the Word became a daily part of my life. A daily part of my life. Anyone can do this. A anyone can do this. You know, you got a Bible? You can do this. You know, you got five minutes? You can do this. He, he gives you 24 hours every day. How about five? You know, just... I mean, if you got more, that's great too, but every, every day. See, I've made some dumb decisions in my life. I don't know about any of you, but I've made some dumb decisions in my life. But the decisions that I have made that have been truly wise have been made because I learned to recognize Jesus' voice. And I learned to recognize Jesus' voice by listening to it every day. Every day. Psalm, Psalm 19, uh, verse 7 says this, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. And boy, does it ever. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise those who have advanced degrees. Making wise those who have high IQs. Making wise is simple. Anybody can do this. Because He really will make you wise. See, I had learned a lot about the Bible Growing up, I'd learned all the stories, and I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd learn. I, I was part of the, uh, what, what do they call it, the, the Bible quiz thing? What's that called? Well, a sword drill, that's Baptist. Yeah, no. AG, good old AG is the, the teen Bible quiz. Yeah, the teen Bible quiz thing. You had to memorize the whole freaking chapter to be able to compete in that thing because the questions were, 
crazy. You know, I'd, done a, I'd learned a lot about the Bible, but learning a lot about the Bible is not the same thing as having it in your life every day. You take somebody who knows a lot of stuff about the Bible and somebody who reads it every day, I'll take this one. When it comes to making the right decisions, when it comes to acting wise. And then the second thing that Jesus did to uh, keep it from, you know, doing this was the, the people that Jesus brought into my life. When I decided to give my life to back to the Lord, uh, I, I was 25 and I knew exactly where I was going to church. I was going to go to church where Larry Case was because Larry and I had grown up together and we'd been good friends and he had never left the Lord. And I went, you know, I want to do that. So I went that Sunday morning, stood up in the front row, did my Alan Smith thing, cried like a baby and gave my life to the Lord. And Larry came and threw his arms around me. I went, this, I'm, this is good. I'm home. And then about a year later, he brought Margaret into my life and click, I was locked in. <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to take this ride from uh, the rest of the way. Uh, and then he led us to the Lord's Chapel, uh, Wade Hutchison and Wayne Berry and Bruce Coble and, and, and others. And it, and it got to the point where if I was going to fall away from the Lord, I would have to totally walk away from the life that I had to get away from him. And that's one of the reasons why that's one of the reasons why people need to be in church. We know Jesus individually, but this is a corporate journey. I mean, it is a corporate journey. Uh he 66 books in the Bible. See, I know that. 66 books in the Bible. Uh 60 of them are written to everybody, 6 of them are written to individuals. But those six that are written to individuals are instructions to them about how to live with everybody in the, in the church or in, in, in the fellowship where, where, God, where God has put them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says this, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You know, how would you like it if you, if you woke up tomorrow morning and your right leg decided to just not come? Or maybe your maybe maybe your two front teeth decided oh, we're not doing it today. We got something else to do. No, I mean you are you are a part of the body of Christ, and it's important to be there. It's important to be there for you. It's important to be there for everybody else. And if you got kids, let me tell you, it's really important to be there because they need to. You know, your kids may be as ornery as I was. How many of you know what Henri means? You almost be Yankees if you don't know what Henri means. Yeah. And they, and they need to see, hey, this is what we do. This is, this is what faithfulness looks like. And then they need to see the same person at home that they saw here. Can I say that again? They need to see the same person at home that they saw here. That's, that's, it's important. But Jesus, I know, can be trusted wherever he leads. And if you really get to know him, he'll take you some really cool places. He really will. Uh, a word from the Lord is more precious than gold. When I, when I came back to the Lord, I was working for the Nashville Public Library, I was a senior library assistant. Note the word senior. <laughs> with that, with emphasis on that rather than assistant. Uh, and I, uh, you know, and, and, and I was doing that when Margaret and I got married. And she was making like three times as much money as I was. And I was disturbed by this. You know, and I went to the Lord. And I went, Lord, you know, I'm supposed to be you know, I'm supposed to be doing this. And, and he goes, well, what do you want me to do? Get her fired? I have given you a beautiful woman who makes a lot of money and loves you and loves me. Now tell me what your problem is. <laughs> well, 
Well, ultimately, I mean, we were going to we start having kids and stuff, and the senior library assistant wasn't going to bring it all in. So uh, I, I wanted, I decided I wanted a job with the federal government. And you go, why? <laughs> well, you see, I, I wanted my nights and weekends free so I could serve the Lord on nights and weekends. And I didn't really have a good grasp of the fact that I was also serving the Lord during the weekdays from <laughs> Eight to five when I was when I was there helping people and talking to people at, at critical junctures in their life. But anyway, I, I, I got a job with the Social Security Administration, worked there for uh, five years, no, four years and 11 months. You get vested at five years, but I, I worked there for four years and 11 months. And the reason why I stopped, uh, at, at some point during my 20s, after I came back to the Lord, I realized, you know, I probably, I probably should be a pastor. And so I, I applied to go to a seminary and they said, no, we, we don't want you here. <laughs> and uh, that, no explanation. They just didn't want me there. And so uh, I, I think it was probably the Lord who didn't want me there. So he put me through my own training, which was you're going to be reading it. You're going to be in the word every day and you're going to do the, the, the Kevin O'Day method of getting trained. You're going to work with the, with the nursery. You're going to work with the children. You're going to work with the youth. You're going to uh, lead worship. You're going to be on a worship team. You're going to be an elder. You're going to be a greeter and all, all that business. Uh, so that's really training, you know, to be, to become a pastor. And, uh, so I, uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't go to seminary, and I was just kind of waiting on things, and I was working for Social Security, and we had one child. Actually, we had two at this point. Uh, Arwen had just been born, and Bruce Coble calls me into his office and says, uh, they're moving me to a different position here at the church. Would you be interested in being the youth pastor? I said, yes. Do you want to pray about it? No. <laughs> I already know. You know, I know that it's what, what I'm supposed to do. And so uh, I, I did that. And, uh, and after, I guess, three years there, and, and the church was blowing and going, and it was, you know, it was doing well. And I was, I was, my intention was to be the world's oldest youth pastor. That's, that's what I someday wanted to be. That was my goal, my ambition. Uh, but in the meantime, the Lord began to change my heart, and we, uh, we, we went to Zimbabwe. Uh, a lot of, a lot of you know that, and it was uh, August, I guess late August. It was August when we went to visit Bruce and Jill, wasn't it, Wade? Okay, yeah, I caught you off guard. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was August, so it's probably September. I uh, came back. I told Margaret, "We're going to Zim Zimbabwe," <laughs> and she went. <laughs> Really? You, you know, I've seen that look in your eyes before. We're probably going. And there's a, there's a story about how the Lord confirmed that, but I don't really have time to tell that story right now. So maybe uh, you can ask me later on if you don't already know it. A bunch of you already know it. Uh, has to do with luggage. And, but anyway, he confirmed that we were going. And, you know, so by early December, we knew we'd been approved. They said, yeah, yeah, come on. Uh, by the end of December, Arwen had spinal meningitis and spent the next 10 days in Vanderbilt Hospital. Uh, in the first five days, she had no idea she was in the world. But we knew what this was all about. We went, this, is, this is just the enemy. He's trying to distract us because we knew that we knew that we knew. When you got a word from God. And so, yeah, no ill effects. You know, she, she, she came out. She was healed. We sold our house. Over the next eight months, we moved six times. Uh, when, we, when we were flying to go over, we, uh, Isaac got sick in Amsterdam, and, and they weren't going to let him on the plane, and that was going to cause all kinds of problems. So God just healed him so he could get on the plane and fly to Zimbabwe with us. And uh, we, we were told we needed about $1,900 a month to live on. This was the, this was the, the, the 80s. And we had $1,300 a month pledged. And, you know, off we go into the wild blue yonder. And usually you get about half the pledges that, that have been, been made to you. Uh, but we knew that we knew that we knew. When we got there, uh, 
We found out we didn't have work permits. Okay, big deal. We'll just come in for a while. And so we did, and we got work permits. And, um, and you know, this money thing, I kind of began to go, okay, well, this might be an issue. Uh, but I was, I was introduced to some people that would give you a much better rate on your money. And I thought, okay, this could be the solution. And God goes, no, 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 no. Yeah, but that, that's... This isn't, this isn't your problem. This isn't your issue. This is mine. And then um, at that time, the economy crashed in South Africa, and the, uh, the RAND went to like 7 to 1 on the dollar, and, and we could buy a, a really nice car, a late model, and we could bring it into the country, and we could sell it. And I thought, okay, well, I got it. Th- that's it. God has opened the door here, and God goes, I didn't send you there to trade cars. It's not why you're there. There was never a month that less than 2,000 came in. Every month, the the need was met. And not only that, when the time came to come back, he had been able to set aside enough money to pay us back the money we had spent to move over when we sold our house. Uh, This isn't, it's not about the money. I mean, the tithe had settled that. that. That, that's, as Barbie said, I, I had the same blessing to grow up with it and know, okay, well, this is just what you do, and God takes care of things. Because you know what? It's what you do, and God takes care of things. That's, that's what happens. And I saw my parents' example of faithfulness, and I saw God take care of them their entire lives. Some of you know that, uh, you know, our, our son, uh, Isaac, has this, this bakery business going. And, you know, it's so great. It's really good. But, you know, he stepped out of a really nice job into a really uncertain situation. Well, how did he do that? Well, he, he was like, this was like the fourth generation of seeing faithfulness. And that's how you end up doing that. That's why you want your parents, your, your kids to see it. Anyway, we left the comfort of Zimbabwe, and we came to a church that couldn't afford a pastor in Smyrna, but they wanted a good-looking young guy. And uh, so, so there, there, there he is with, uh, with the original uh, church board uh, from when I first came. And you know what? Every step that we made, I, I don't regret a single one of them because I'd heard from God. And when you hear from God, you don't, have, you don't end up having regrets. The Jesus I know can be trusted. And the Jesus I know, and this probably is the point, if you don't remember anything else, this is what I really want to say. The Jesus that I know does not show favoritism. Peter, in the book of Acts, went into Cornelius' house, and there was a bunch of Gentiles there, and, and he, he just he wasn't even supposed to be there. And he felt very uncomfortable, and that gummit, the Holy Spirit fell and just filled the place, and all of a sudden Peter's got to go, I might need to change my way of thinking. And his way of thinking got changed into, I now, res- I now see that God does not show favoritism at all. Jesus didn't do these things, and I've only shared a few of them, but Jesus didn't do these things for me because of my heritage or because of my talents or because of my unusual devotion, because I am not unusually devoted. There are people who are far more in their devotion than I am. I'm, I'm, I wear my vest unbuttoned. Anyone can do this. Any, anyone can do this. Parents, bring your kids to church. You can do that. I mean, who, who can't do that? Bring your kids to church. Let them see this is what faithfulness looks like. And let them see consistency in your life. You'll change your entire family line. Anyone can do that. You'll mess up. Go, well, man, I tried that, but you know, I kind of messed up. You will mess up. Big deal. You still play Mario Kart. I mean, just because you had a wreck doesn't mean you stop. You know, you still, some of you still play golf, even after that quadruple bogey, and you didn't count the five strokes that you didn't count. 
You still try to grow plants even though they die. Why would you not keep on trying to walk with the Lord? Just because, just because, you, just because you mess up. Anyone can read the Word every day. Anyone can. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to pick it up and go, okay, let's see. What, the Lord is my shepherd. I oh, wonder what that means. The Holy Spirit will speak to you every day. He absolutely will. Any, anyone, can, anyone can tithe. You know, Barbie didn't, didn't read it in second service. First service, she read the verse that you've heard if you've ever heard a sermon on tithing. You know, bring the full tithe into the storehouse and see if I won't pour out enough blessing so that you won't be able to contain it. But it starts out with, test me in this. How do you know he's faithful if you never test him? How, how do you know he will come through if you, if you never give him a chance, because you got it covered. Anyone can draw close to him and he will surely accept you. One other thing that I've, that I've learned, there are no wasted years. There are no wasted years. The, uh, that, those, those years from... Um, 69 to 75, when I was away from the Lord and, and, and doing all the stuff that I could possibly do. Uh, and, and when I came back to the Lord, my, my initial thinking was, oh, you know, those, those years were so wasted. No, they weren't. There are people who are going to go to heaven and spend eternity with God because I was there during those years. And, and the, reason, the reason why we have a, the, the theater, and some people have gotten saved through it, has been because of those, waste, those years, those wasted years. Uh, you see, eternity not only starts now, it goes in both directions. In everything, God is at work for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Yeah. Even what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. When Alan shared his, his testimony, you guys can come on out. I mean, I don't want people to get nervous. I am getting close to being finished. <laughs> when Alan shared his testimony uh, and shared about adultery, it struck a chord with a lot of people. Not all of them because of adultery, but just, you know, the, the transparency and the, and the honesty and, and, and the beauty of what of what he shared. And, and, the, and the issue may not be adultery, but we all have failures. We all have some pretty serious failures and things of which we are ashamed. Because that's life in a fallen world. And if we don't think that we do, it's because we've never gotten close enough to God to see the sin in our lives. Well, Alan, Alan isn't proud of committing adultery, but he is proud of a Jesus who lifts us out of the miry clay, sits our feet on a solid rock, puts a new song in our mouths, a song of praise to our God. From 69 to 75, I, I did everything I could to run from Jesus. And it wasn't just substance abuse and immorality. It, it was it was cursing and mocking and, and I, I don't know him I don't have anything to do with him or those who are associated with him but there are people who were I encountered during those years and God turned it around and went, hey what happened in your life man what can I get some of that Eternity goes in both directions. And regardless of what you have done, regardless of where you are right now, the Jesus I know will not abandon you. He will receive you. He will restore you. He will keep you. He gives second, third, fourth, fifth, millionth chances. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So anybody can do this. And that's the Jesus that I know. Bless you.